Howdy. Welcome. Really glad to have you with us today. As Ed Sullivan used to say, <laughs> we're going to have a really big show. Really big show. And today what you're going to see is going to be an exclusive. You're not going to find this information out anywhere else out there on YouTube. And uh, to join us today, we got a special guest. I'm going to introduce him to you here in a minute. <laughs> this is going to be really good. Uh, today we're going to ride track here after a brief introduction. And we're going to go out and we're going to ride track. And what we're going to do is do a track inspection. And uh, this is not just... We're going to show you everything that needs to be done on the, what we look for in a track inspection. Uh, we have class 2 track here. And uh, our speed limit is 25. Code of Federal Regulations require me to do a minimum once a week track inspection on our track. The higher the classes of track, the faster the speed, the more stringent the uh, Code of Federal Regulations become. So, uh, our exclusive today. <laughs> we got a, oh, this is going to be a fun day. I can't wait. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to show you. Uh, Steve's going to talk to you about what a major class one railroad such as Canadian Pacific expects out of their track inspectors. Okay. So this is going to be good. All right. We'll be right back. Okay, we're here. This is Steve McCarthy. Steve, really great to have you with us today. Thank you very it's going much. To be a great day. Thank you. I wanted to say a few things about Steve. First, uh, he has a really, really cool uh, YouTube channel over at Stormy Sky Rail Productions. And if you guys like to watch trains, this is the place you want to go. Believe me, it's uh, Steve puts out a, a, a show. I never miss it. And he that one you had last night with all those really old cool cars. Oh, I love those. He catches all kind of old cars, and I love that. Okay? <laughs> uh, let me say this. Uh, we're, a, we're a coal mine, not a railroad. And we're governed by the Mine Safety Health Administration. So Steve has all these railroad safety training, but he had to go through the safety training program here in order to ride with us on the truck. So he's met all the qualifications for that. Also, uh, when I approached the harbor supervisor here about having Steve come out, they were very, very receptive. And it's gonna be really good for our railroad. So, but the problem is that he, Steve isn't getting compensated. Now he's gonna share a bunch of his railroad knowledge with you guys. He's not getting compensated. He had to pay all his expenses for the trip here from Wisconsin. So after you uh, watch this video, <laughs> Then go over and check out some of Steve's videos. Steve's got a merchandise store, and it'll be really cool. You guys show your appreciation by checking out some of his merchandise and um, purchasing something. So I'll turn it over to you, Steve. And uh, like I said, it's great to have you with us. Uh, tell us a little bit about your trip to the <laughs> Canadian Pacific. Oh, thank you ha for having us, David. We're greatly appreciated. Oh, it's my for pleasure. This. Um, I have 25 years with the Canadian Pacific Railroad. <coughs> Started out as a section labor on a rail yeah. relay crew or a rail gang, they called it back then. Uh, on the river sub, this is Canadian Pacific River sub, I started as south as Hastings, Minnesota. Traveled a lot up and down that river sub that first year. <coughs> then I got back home in the fall and then got to my section form, uh, my section labor date with uh, section down in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where the old Milwaukee road yard uh -huh. used to be. Me. Then uh, about three years after, I was forced on, by all the older guys to get my CDL, DOT, and start <laughs> getting my uh, dates. And uh, so I got my assistant foreman's date on the mainline section. <coughs> and then uh, I got my foreman's date a year later. Uh, my first foreman's job was uh, running a nine-man uh, utility crew, mm -hmm. nine crew, yeah. uh, nine people. And we put ties in all summer uh, and did that. So I was 24 years old when I got that done. Nice. Uh, most of my year was section foreman <laughs> and uh, covered a bunch, bunch in uh, northern Illinois and uh, southeast Wisconsin area. Uh -huh. And then uh, <coughs> later on in my life, 
I became track inspector. Uh, once, uh, the first time in the yard there, and then I jumped over to the main line uh, and finished up there. Uh, I'm medically uh, retired now, so I'm enjoying the hobby part of it again. And um, it, it's great having uh, uh, people like Dave inviting uh, me me to do stuff like this and, and show uh, the knowledge that I've learned from the Milwaukee Road uh, uh, predecessors I worked for. Uh, I got I got taught a lot of talents and stuff back in the old days of railroading, okay. and I, I I I'm so glad to still share that yeah. with, with and, uh, people. You know, it, this is this is like I said, this is an exclusive. This is really special to hear this kind of stuff. We're going to talk railroading all day long. <laughs> oh yeah, it's going to be great. And we did present him a shirt at Stormy Sky Rail Productions just uh, this morning. So. so you want to tell them a little bit about what all you got available? <laughs> we got uh, <coughs> shirts. We got coffee mugs. Uh, we got um, uh, all different kinds of shirts for ladies, uh, kids, um, nice. all different sizes. Uh, coffee mugs. We got uh, we got quite a bit of stuff. They'll have to just so, visit the website. Yeah. So, so. Uh, that link you can find from Lauren Steve's uh, channel page, right? Yep. Okay. And Very he good. has some really cool videos, and his videos really attracted us to his channel because it brought me back to all the stuff I used to do and I couldn't keep my eyes off of it and all of a sudden we met and here we are. It, it's awesome. Yeah, we it's become awesome. The really good friends here because and that's really, really special. Yep. Okay. All, all right. right. Thank you, sir. Let's go ride track. Right again. Okay. Morning, everybody. It's Steve McCarthy, Stormy Sky Rail Productions. I'm here riding along with Dave from the Cumberland Mine Railroad and uh, he invited us to come out. So uh, we're looking at what we have done on track patrol here. I'm uh, overseeing, I'm doing a ride along here with him and kind of explaining to him what we did at CP or what I would have did personally as a track inspector the way I was taught by uh -huh. the older gentleman uh, back in the day. So <coughs> we're looking for, <coughs> in the curves, we're looking for like deviations in the curve like rail pushing out in spots that it doesn't look even uh, or one side of the track especially the low side uh, you got a lot of ballast missing in spots and it's even that gives you a telltale sign there's something wrong when it's hot in the summertime very good and then on the other side you'll get more rock piled up in that side so you can tell something's pushing so you get out and look and, and, and stuff like that. Maybe down the line I can we can get out of the truck and we can explain that a little more in detail. But that's uh, part of the curve areas. Or if you see a kicked out joint, uh, then you got a joint issue as far as gauge or anything like that. I don't know what you call them, Steve. We call them elbow joints. Okay, elbow joints. We call them joint bars. Uh, where, where it's kicked out like that a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we call them... Uh, you know, yeah, kick, kicked out joints, you know, and the joints kicked out, you know. So uh, we end up looking for that. And of course, the most important things uh, when it's cold outside, and especially joint and rail, uh, you wanna look for the big gaps in the rail uh, and look at your joint bolts. Uh, either you got four bolts per uh, joint bar, depending upon what railroad and all that kind of stuff. Or you got the average of six bolts per joint bar. Uh, on the class one, we were allowed to have uh, two bolts on the side. One could have been broken to be legal. But if you had one bolt in one side, because you have three bolts per side uh, between the, the joint and the rail. Mm -hmm. So you have one that's only hanging on on one side then you, you got technically a defect on class one track, uh, such as the Canadian right. Pacific. So as a now, track inspector, if you found that, would you get out and put another bolt in, Steve? Yes, if, it, yes, if, and if I, I, then if it, the, the, the bolt holes are uh, kind of not on spot, uh -huh. then you take your drift pin and you try to knock it, knock the rail in. He's, he's got all kind of hand movements over here. <laughs> he's doing it with his hand. You take the drift pin, <laughs> knock uh -huh. it in, 
and see if he can pull that rail together to match up the bolt yeah. holes. If he can get that in, then you go ahead, if the three bolts and one's in, you, you get that one bolt back in the hole, and then you can knock the drift pin out. Yeah. And uh, now, there's use, in, go ahead. Now, it, there's instances where you can't get any bolts in because the bolt holes are so far off because I've pulled apart so much. When it, back when I started, we used uh, fuel oil and sawdust, yeah. which was really smoky, uh, to, to heat that rail back up uh, and then uh, you know retract that sucker close again to put the bolts back in. But then we call then we got purchased what's called fire snake. Yeah. Uh, after a while, you guys have is, seen some of my videos with the fire snake. Right, and and I was a pyro back then. I loved playing <laughs> with fire. Uh, that was my favorite job doing pull apart. Uh, Pull aparts were fun. Okay. Tangent track is is pretty good. Uh, you can have problems with tangent track, low joints, especially if you got joint rail. Uh, you know, you can have the the joint that's uh, you know knocked out a little bit for maybe an open joint or, or uh, wide gauge. I mean, um, pretty much. Your worst problem areas on the railroad that I was taught by the Milwaukee Road guys uh, bringing me up were switches and curves were your worst problem areas of the railroad on, yeah. on straight track. Of course, you got diamonds and you got bridges and stuff. But for the most part, your regular track, the curves and the switches were the most maintenance heading because those are the most, um, most torn apart stuff on the railroad. Most uh, wear and tear on the railroad. Um, of course, when we're uh, out inspecting, especially after a heavy rain, uh, we look for uh, washouts. Yeah, we had a really heavy <laughs> rain here a couple days ago. Okay. We Find all the mud spots easy that way. Yeah, the mud spots. If there's mud spots, you tend to have a little more maintenance headache with uh, surfacing and stuff like that. Um, Rule of thumb too, when you're doing a uh, tie replacement, uh, even regular maintenance tie replacement, you always want to make sure you got good wood under the t uh, rail joints. Yeah. Because that's where they're going to pound the most. So you want, if you're doing a tie replacement, putting brand new ties in, you always want to have good wood surrounding the joint areas because those joints will pound down. So and then after we did that. <coughs> Of course, we, we would tamp them up good. Um, rail joints, of course, pound a lot. They go through a lot, and they lose their surface after a while. In some ways, if you don't have uh, a good, sufficient surface and, and the ballast in, in, the, in that area. That's one thing we've done pretty good over the years is kept up. We usually put in about 2,000 ties a year. Yeah, we, ties we've kept that up pretty good. Ties are very important. Usually, they come through with a tie in the correct way be coming through it's a tie program <coughs> and putting your south however many ties you need put them down and then if you want to do a rail relay it's easier to do them with all the ties down than it is to have rotten ties and not surface track then you have a lot more problems uh, I've had instances where they relayed uh, joint of rail and put the 136 pound rail in and uh, they didn't re redo the ties uh, in that area, uh -huh. and they tamped them up, but, but because the ties are rotten or whatever, you could actually feel in the weld of rail where the joints were. Yeah. So you could actually feel that, you know, oh, here right. was a joint. So it's important to always have a good tie base underneath. With boss and, and, yeah. and with the ballast, of course. It's all possible. We've got some 136 rail out here. We, we try to weld those. 136 to 132 together if at all possible. Yep, and then usually they have a lot of offset kits for all that stuff. And Is there anything special you look for on these bridges, Steve? Uh, Other than what you mentioned there a little bit earlier? Basically, the guardrails, uh, the guardrails are self-sufficient, they're in there. Uh, pull aparts, uh, <coughs> the bridge approaches, I have worked in the track department. We had our other department called the Bridge and Buildings Department. I specifically didn't work okay. in that department. But, however, the bridge approach ends, uh, like we're coming up to now, yeah. 
the bridge is solid. You come off the approaches, and we had a heck of a time with one bridge because you know we always had to tamp the end of the bridge. Right. That's our biggest problem too, is our bridge approaches. Yeah, and the bridge approaches are, are the ones that can get get finicky. They can go down on you. You have to constantly raise them and tamp them, and because of course it's soft ground. You got a bridge and it's still, you know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, also we looked for enough rail anchors on each side of the bridge to make sure you don't have all that rail flow into the bridge, that pushing into the bridge. And then you get all that rail bunched up onto the bridge, and you can cause problems. Yeah, and I, Steve and I was talking before this uh, here. That's one thing we are sadly lacking in here is uh, anchors on the bridge approaches. So that's something we do need to do. It's, uh, it's pretty important, as you said. Yeah, it, it's pretty important, and, uh, and bridges are, 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 if you don't have enough rail anchors on each side to, to uh, make sure that that rail doesn't push all in that one area, you're gonna have problems and you know, nobody wants a derailment by the bridge. No. <laughs> Had our share of derailments, we don't wanna see any more out here. Of course out here, this is different territory uh, than I'm used to. Uh, you got a lot of the uh, bridges here and uh, rock slide potential and <coughs> well you pretty much have to uh watch out for that kind of stuff also yeah we got a situation up here at 690 cut you guys have seen this uh, it's that place before where we're constantly getting rocks fall it's uh, actually a big one came down the locomotive hit it one time lucky it didn't puncture the fuel tank yeah well, and it's now, now another another critical area that uh, I want to mention uh, what to look for is uh, culvert areas. Uh, culvert areas have a tendency. Culvert areas have a tendency to uh, dip down a lot because if you have a soft spot in the culvert, uh -huh. um, the, the track can sag a little bit, and you have a low spot. Yeah, we've had a lot of problems, especially with a lot of our older culverts that the B and B ended up. Uh, Placing. We've and, done the same thing, Steve. There's at least two that we've had where the culvert pipes rusted through in the middle, and you get right, that and dip get in there, and then, and then it will, the water plugs up. The water doesn't want to drain out; yep. it goes down in the middle of the track underneath. And, and, we've had an awful time a couple of those. Right, and and the thing that is with culverts, you know, either their age or, or a collapsed culvert that a lot of B and B people uh, in our you know, on our railroad said, yeah, we gotta replace that culvert. Now, now what do you mean by B and P people? Bridge and Buildings Department. Okay. They're the ones that took care of the culverts and the bridges and the buildings. All right. Uh, we didn't have not all our track, but however, when we worked uh, changing rail or doing something on a bridge or something, uh -huh. we did help the B and B department out. Um, so, and we've had uh, collapsed culverts and, and also the beaver dams. Beavers <laughs> out there. We had the B &B. I'll post 14. We've had beavers too. Yep, the B&B department had unclogged beaver dams a lot because they plug up the culvers and cause problems Yes, they do. The track. I'll tell so. you a story about that when we're off camera. Okay. When we had. It's two uh, in long tangent situations this like this. This is the longest tangent we have. So in this kind of situation, let's say, <coughs> for instance, one shoulder wasn't dumped properly or a tie program came through and it's waiting to be dumped. Let's say the temperature jumped up to 100 degrees. In the hot weather inspections, you always want to watch on tangent track any line swing deviations that you don't normally see. That could be a telltale sign. Okay, you don't have enough rock on that side of the shoulder. And it's important to have... Now, I learned something in my railroad career that I never thought about. Okay. I thought... I thought that the shoulder part, the outside of the track, if you had enough rock on the outside, was more important than having enough rock in between the track. No. No, it's the opposite. No, and I got right. taught that. Actually, more, the more holding power you have is in the middle of the track. I've always heard 75% in the middle and 25% on the both ends. But however, what? however, me, my, each foreman on, on the railroad, that especially that I worked for, had their pet peeves on their section. Uh -huh. I was a section foreman, and I loved my ballast, okay? <laughs> I would go to my supervisor all the time, 
and I would say, hey, I need a rock car. We don't have no shoulder here in stretches. He said, well, well, we'll see what we can do. I was always on about rock. You know, of course, everything's important, but each foreman had their pet peeve. Mine was ballast. I, I had to make sure it looked pretty uh -huh. because I wanted to make sure my track looked good. So that was my pet peeve. And um, so this track right here is really good. I mean, a lot of, so, a lot of sufficient ballast, um, a lot of good stuff. We get in a curve, I always like to put more ballast on the outside and less ballast on the inside. I did think that too. However, um, I was taught by a few of uh, the older guys too uh -huh. that sometimes that can bite you because then you don't have enough rock and, and if the track goes back, it, like, it gets cold and it cold. Let's say you have the track pushing a little bit when it's warm. Yeah. And all of a sudden it gets cold out and the track goes back. If you don't have sufficient enough ballast on that side, but over abundant on that side, then you're going to actually have a gap. You're, you're going to have gaps in the in the curve uh -huh. on the shoulder side okay. of how much that track. We had that incident. So you like keeping about even on both sides then? Even on both sides if you can. That, yeah. that would be a good practice because then it's even amount of the forces uh, in between. Well, that makes track. sense. Thank uh, you. I see we got a mud spot right here. Oh, this is a little mud spot. I couldn't stand mud spots, especially in the winter. You <laughs> took your picks out and you picked it down to get rock underneath. And uh, yeah, I had to dig a uh, uh, ballast hole. Where do you so. get up up bridge too? You want to see a mud spot? So, <laughs> but we 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 have mud spots no matter where. We have mud spots in class one, short lines, yards. I've done a lot of cribbing in this tangent. I haven't gotten the, didn't get it all, but about three years ago, I've done the, probably seventy percent of the whole tangent. I cribbed out. It was bad. We had the vac train come out a few times, but uh, I wish we could have did more undercutting, but then they laid, laid fiber optic along the right away. And that, yeah, there that, you go. That cut that out. Um, undercutting is the way to go, but it's, <laughs> we got to have down track time to do that. Yeah. Because we don't have the people. You know, that like Canadian Pacific, you got to well, we work hired, with. When we had uh, undercut and their vac trains, we uh, had Herzog or, or uh, Ram come in or somebody like that. Yeah, and that's where it hurts is we're, we don't interchange with anybody. You know, we can't get right. that big stuff in here. Exactly. I, I'd love to have a rail grinding program, but <laughs> there's no way we're going to get one of the low ram rail grinders in here. Just no way. I've worked on uh, switch grinders. I've piloted uh, switch grinders. I've piloted uh, regular uh, main no. line, line rail grinders. And, we could uh, get a little switch grinder in here, but it takes a long time to do a whole 16 some miles. Yeah, huh? yeah. With that switch, switch grinder. grinder yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll take a little break here and uh, be right back. <laughs> 